Good evening, friends. Good evening, friends. <clears throat> My name is Usha Balakrishnan, and I know most of you, um, but not all of you. I'm really looking forward to meeting each one of you that is here. Um, thank you for coming to our program today. I'm the founder of Karta, a 501c3 nonprofit based in Iowa City. Karta has been the strongest partner early incubator and supporter to the nationally recognized India Wintrim program since inception. As some of you will know, University of Iowa professor, now emeritus professor Raj Rajagopal, designed the very first India Wintrim program course in 2006 to go to Madurai with 15 student participants learning about social entrepreneurship in healthcare. Since then, over 1,200 students and faculty have journeyed from Iowa to different sites and nonprofits in India, including Pallium India in Trivandrum, Kerala. Karta, my nonprofit, provided nearly $50,000 in travel stipend support for students in the Wintrim India Partnership designating a select few as Karta Fellows. One such supported student was Aparna Ajarapu, who then published an article on pain narratives she had collected from visiting with Pallium India clients along with a Malayalam translator. I mention all this right now, since we will delightfully revisit these factoids again at 8 p.m. So stay tuned. By asking the simple yet profound question, what are your aspirations for humanity? Karta brings together all volunteer intergenerational teams of academics, practitioners, and public citizens from dozens of disciplines, sectors, and regions. Karta's mission is to cultivate collaborative doers for humanity, focusing on social innovation, fusion philanthropy, and healthfulness. Our recent Glocalizer programs address loneliness as a public health dilemma by encouraging musical interventions and poetry that makes us feel youthful and connects us back to childhood memories. For example, we are currently working with the city of Iowa City to embed a musical something at the Willow Creek Park when it is upgraded in the coming months to create new platforms upon which new friendships can be forged. We designed the Karta Iowa Corridor Sangeet Collaborative led by Dr. Nitin Karandikar, who's here in the audience. Nitin and Ashwini, could you please stand? Just take a bow. <clears throat> This past year, with Nitin's help, we have brought eight highly successful programs with Bollywood, as well as classical Indian musicians performing in our area. Through the support of individual donors, partners, and grant-making agencies, such as Humanities Iowa, all these programs are kept free and open for the public to attend. In case any of you is interested, the next program, organized by Nitin again at the Kurulville Center for the Performing Arts, is slated for the evening of October 2nd, which happily coincides, as many of you will recognize, with Mahatma Gandhi's birthday. Today's Glocalizer, what we uniquely titled 
as a dying well dialogue around the topic of palliative care was organized specifically to feature Padma Shri Dr. M. R. Rajagopal, an inspiring, just thoroughly inspiring humanitarian from India whose presence has blessed our town for the last three days. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Rajagopal. I thank each one of you for coming for this evening. On this occasion, I quickly express my deep gratitude to two emeritus professors from the University of Iowa, Dr. Keith Guillory, who retired from the College of Pharmacy, and Dr. Roger Williamson, who retired from the Carver College of Medicine. I also thank the Iowa City Channel 4 TV and Ty Coleman for videotaping this program. Uh, so that it airs on public TV later on. And I also thank the University Club, especially Bobby and Abby. For the beautiful opening tunes on the violin with evening ragas, I ask you to again give a warm round of applause to our 2018 Karta Fellow, um, Akash Gururaja. Akash is a Linmar High School senior from Cedar Rapids. He aspires to be a physician someday and is a Kartha Fellow in our Music and Memories program. He has been playing the violin to enliven audiences in nursing homes and to also raise funds for important causes such as hospice and palliative care. Thank you so much for playing for us, Akash. Now we shall zip through our formal part of the program. Next up is a poetry reading by Marcus Brown, our 2016 Kartha Fellow in Creative Writing and Humanitarianism. Marcus is a recent graduate of the University of Iowa, where he served as the chief editor of the Earthwards Undergraduate Literary Review. Marcus, you're on. He now works at the Iowa City um, downtown district. Hi there. Um, well, I don't think there's much more for me to say other than the wonderful introduction Usha just gave me, so I think I'm just going to go ahead and go into my poem. This poem is called, Will You Pass Me the Remote? <laughs> <laughs> I wondered about her hands more than anything, when the tendons, joints, cords, knots, synapses, and all these Connections unraveled in her mind first, herself and the world, herself and us, herself. Down the spine to the hands and everywhere else, she forgot how to breathe and I didn't understand that. But the hands, the hands I could understand. She can't hold things anymore, he told me. Oh, like when you fall asleep funny? Well, yes, kind of, but. And it trailed, but still I thought, she can't hold things anymore, that I can understand. She's still here, but she isn't holding on to anything anymore. We are holding on to her. And one day we won't be able to hold her here anymore. We can hold what's left of her and hold her here tightly. But even that won't be enough, says the man who opened the door, held her tightly as he lifted her up from the toilet, wiped her first before the ambulance came. We can't hold her here anymore. We weren't meant to, and she doesn't want us to, and maybe that's okay. Because I remember it as punishment sitting with her, talking with her. Back when there was static between the channels and she didn't always know when she was just watching the static, if it mattered anymore, and I watched her watching the static, wondering about the hands, thin and so weak. And perhaps I was wondering about the wrong thing, the hands but not the hands of the woman who may have only remembered being a punishment. Asking her grandson, Vincent, no, no, but you are your daddy's son, to change the channels for her, to something static or anything but still, the last attempts to hold anything before, hands too weak to close, open and release what we can no longer hold here. And the last punishment isn't keeping her here, it's letting her go. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. You all know why um, I call Marcus the performance poet. I don't know whether he sang the poem or read it. 
Um, so loneliness um, in a planet of 7.6 billion people, that sounds rather paradoxical. And particularly human loneliness during end of life seems to be pretty specific. It's a different form. Um, I did not recognize it. I've, I've been lonely before, you know, I came like many of my Indian friends in this room um, at age 20 after an arranged marriage. Um, I didn't know anybody in the Uni United States at all. Um, thankfully, at age 21, when I arrived in Iowa City, my first friend is still here, actually. Uda, where are you? Please. So Uda Grimlin was my very, very first friend in Iowa City. Um, thank goodness for that. When my mother last year began to suffer from worsening symptoms of congestive heart failure, a normally cheerful person started feeling lonely. She couldn't go out. She was like stuck at home. And I'm here in the United States. My sister was next door, which was very convenient. Um, but that's when I realized that I had, I mean, I mean I'm not a palliative care person. I mean, I, I have no idea about, um, you know, what goes on with, you know, terminal patients or patients facing end of life. So it was great that, you know, I connected through my own physician, Dr. Sarah Thomas, who's here in the audience. Where are you, Sarah? She's affiliated with Mercy Hospital. Oh, there, you have to, re you have to stand up. Um, so um, Sarah said, you should talk to both Anne Broderick and to Emma Rajagopal in Trivandrum, Kerala. So that's what I did. And thankfully I did, because till then, my mother had gone to the hospital 10 times in four months after figuring out that there was something else here she could actually be doing or considering. Um, I just want to share with you that one thing that my mother did get affected by was singing. So I sang to her every single day, whether it was on the phone from here or when I was visiting Chennai, I would sit by her and do my music practice. And I saw rapid improvement in the level of reduced anxiety. That's like really, I mean, shortness of breath in CHF is a big problem. Anxiety going down helped her. So I'm gonna sing for you just one line of a song that comes from uh, an old Tamil film in the 1960s that kind of relates to our discussion here too. And it was one of my mother's favorite songs and movies actually. <clears throat> Nalandana Udalum Mullamum Nalandana Udalum Mullamum Nalandana What does that mean? That's in Tamil. Nalandana means are you well? Are you well? And then it says are you well on the inside and the outside? Are you really well? Are you really well on the inside and the outside? So anyways, um, talking about parents and losing parents, I called one of my neighbor's daughters um, who lost her father recently. So I'm going to have her come up and read something special for us, Shirley Wang. Um, she's a recent graduate of Tufts University in journalism. And she grew up in Iowa City. And um, she now works at Iowa Public Radio. Shirley. Hi. So, you know, one of the best parts about living in Iowa City is getting to run into Usha all over town. So, <laughs> thanks for the opportunity. So, as she was saying, my dad passed away very recently um, after a long battle against heart cancer. He was treated at the UI hospital, just five minutes away from my house. And towards the end of his life, he was put into palliative care. He really had the most amazing doctors, and we really gave him the best chances he could. Um, but in the end, it just it wasn't enough. It was too much to take. Um, 
So last year I uh, took a break from a semester at school. I stayed at home and stayed with my dad and I participated at the University of Iowa um, in a program where I designed a project that required me to translate a poem from uh, Chinese to English. Um, so my dad and I, him sitting on the couch and not going to work, feeling very tired, watching TV, um, we sat down and translated this poem together. It's about a storm, El Nino, ripping through Taiwan. It tore apart homes, people's lives, people's futures. Any sense of security dissolved in this terrifying moment and reminded people of how human and how vulnerable we all are. At the end of the poem, the storm clears. It leaves behind an X on the doorstep, which the poet calls a kiss on the household. It's a symbol of peacemaking. Um, it's a testament, testament to the belief that no matter how horrible and upsetting disasters can be, there's always beauty and peace to be found. You just have to know how to see it. So um, I don't know if there's any Mandarin speakers in here, but uh, if not, just enjoy the sounds of this poem. Um, here's an excerpt. <clears throat> 在此亲吻地球，风在此美丽，我们太久出来，只在家里找找到了宝宝的门，看了开甜美的X。Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Shirley. Um, as I was organizing um, this program, um, mostly because Dr. Anne Broderick told me one week after my mother had passed away that in fact Dr. Emma Rajagopal was going to be in town in mid-September. And she said, we're looking for people to do like a community gathering with Indians. And I said, you know, let me try to transmute my grief and do something useful with my life in memory of my mom. So that's why we are here. Um, I think if my mom was alive, I could not have been here. I would have been in India right now. Um, in any case, I ended up very quickly, within like two weeks, talking to a couple of dozen physicians and nurses and just public citizens locally, community volunteers. So some of them were listed in sort of like my um, um, flyer with the announcement about the program. But I'll quickly mention a couple or more of them that have made a huge shift in my own awareness for what could be done in palliative care, even if I didn't understand. I'm not trying to become an expert in palliative care, but death affects each one of us. And we better be prepared. We better have coping skills developed in our younger people. Um, this was something that Dr. Rahul Rastogi, he's an anesthesiologist in the University of Iowa, like director of the Chronic Pain Medicine Clinic, he just said, Usha, seriously, there are some things that medical infrastructure cannot handle. Those are things that the community members can do. Please help us. And one of them is how do you engage younger people between their 20s and 40s to have these early coping skills developed. At 53, I don't think I had developed my coping skills. It, it has been very hard. So that's why I sort of want Marcus or Shirley or Akash to kind of like, you know, be part of these dialogues and know what's going on, what can happen. Um, and then, of course, um, I talked to my friends Gigi Kantamneni, Anjana Agarwal, and Neera Khera, and each one of them, who I've known for years, I had never talked to them about palliative care issues, except for organizing this gathering. So death and dying is not part of our conversational piece unless somebody dies in our own families. So we don't get to know what to do or how to be prepared. Um, so in any case, I just want to say two things. 
Carol Tibby from the birdhouse insisted that I use the word dying. And that's how we titled this glocalizer, Dying Well. Thank you, Carol. Where are you? Thank you so much. And Carla Kamal, where are you? OK. Carla, who's, so Carol is with the birdhouse. Carla um, Kamal is with the Iowa City Hospice. So I said, so, so I mean, tell me about hospice, right? So Carla says, OK, number one, just remember, hospice is a philosophy, a philosophy of compassion, a philosophy of caring. And it's like, wow, I mean, I didn't know that. I mean, I thought it was, so we don't even understand structural issues with regard to these. I mean, I'm, I'm just like, I'm not pretending ignorance. I'm just telling you, as a public citizen, I mean, educated, apparently, as a public citizen, I didn't know hospice was a philosophy. Did any of you know? Did every one of you know? Please, if you didn't know, can you raise your hands? Please. I mean, this is important. This is how we learn, we share, and exchange perspectives. So in any case, I think if we can think about new things that could be done, um, these are issues worth taking note of and worth sharing with your friends. So that's the main purpose of this dialogue. And we have such a special person amongst us that can kick off this dialogue. And now it's time for Dr. Anne Broderick to come up and introduce our chief guest and featured speaker for the day, Dr. Emma Rajagopal. It's been an, an amazing sisterhood to bring Dr. Raj here. Uh, Usha's part of the sisterhood. Uh, Kishel Lachman, my pharmacy colleague. Stephanie Gilbertson White, who I don't see. Oh, there she is. Um, thank you to my to my sisters in crime and my sisters in bringing uh, Dr. Raj here. Um, you'll be amused to know that Raj had a wonderful Iowa City experience when we um, we barely uh, pulled up in front of Hotel Vitro, opened the door, and saw in the distance. Uh, VJ, one of our students from last year with his mother, um, and had that moment, walked into vitro, saw Dr. John Ely, who had worked with Dr. Rajagopal uh, just two years ago, and uh, it has happened uh, like that over the last two or three days, people who have a connection, uh, the, the Thomases as well. How to introduce Raj. I've been introducing him for the last couple days. I don't want you to hear that introduction again. He is a uh, mentor, a teacher, a friend. Four years ago, Dr. Uh, Joe Eland, professor of uh, nursing, photographer is how many of us know her, uh, saw me at a retirement uh, event for Sherry Vall, uh, one of the first palliative care nurses, at, or the first palliative care nurse at University Hospitals. And she said, I think I've told this story too many times, but let me just tell it one more time. She said, Anne, would you be interested in going to India, all expenses paid, with, I don't know, some undergraduates? And I said, let me think about that. Yes. So uh, four years now, I've been going. And the reason I go is that it broadens my palliative care experience and my practice every time I go. Uh, Raj is uh, a role model, um, and I've only seen him angry once. And that's when I was sitting, I, I was uh, rounding on the inpatient unit, and we were standing next to the patient's uh, bed. Yes, Paula Forrest is going, uh-oh, big, big problem. He said, why are you standing at the bedside? Well, we found chairs very quickly then and continued our interview. 
He has a way of teaching normally by modeling, but that time he did it by direct correction, and uh, we got the lesson, and I need that booster shot uh, every single year. So we, we have a vision. Uh, I have a vision that the community can be involved in connecting uh, hospitals and people, uh, people who need palliative care. This is the vision that I've learned from Dr. Raj uh, from, from India. It's the vision that we show students every single year is that you can uh, volunteers can be a critical part of uh, palliative care. So uh, I don't know if I've taken my four minutes, but I'm going to cede the rest of my minutes to Dr. Raj Akapol. Welcome to Iowa City again, Raj. Thank you, Anne, and Usha, and uh, all of you. Thank you for being here. I met many of you earlier today and uh, some of you in during the last two days and many new faces. It's such a great experience to make all these new friends. Today, Anne brought me here. I got out of the car, walked across, sat down and I am now standing before you and st talking. I know that is a temporary state of affairs. It cannot happen all the time, I know. I have only about 10% chance of dying a sudden death. 9 out of 10 chance is that I will go through a period of illness, a variable period of illness before I go. Usha reminds us, that there is one element of suffering which is not usually written about much in our thick books on palliative medicine that is loneliness and that is a terrible suffering to have uh, and I don't know Kashel do you have on all your pharmacology a right kind of medicine to treat that. My suffering at that time could be physical. I don't know. I don't know if my wife will still be there or will she go before me. I don't know whether as I am lying in one bed, she would be lying in another bed. These are all possibilities. I have two loving sons and their wives care for me very much and I have three loving grandchildren. But I am not sure how much of time they will be able to give me at that time. I am sure they will want, they will really care for me. And uh, Usha, as you possibly connected on the phone at least, they will connect with me. But still, I could be physically lonely. And maybe my colleagues and I start thinking, you know, start, need to start more actively planning campaigns to treat that symptom. And I don't think we are doing enough. We keep talking about growing our volunteers' forces and matching lonely people to connect more of our volunteers with the lonely people. And some who take care of that physical suffering, at least partly. I have a friend and a guru, a British nurse by name Jilly Byrne, whom I heard for the first time talking about palliative care in 92. And she told me a story in Kolkata. She was taken around by a volunteer there was no palliative care in Kolkata, but somebody working with some non-government organization to the slums of Kolkata. And there, in a slum, uh, in, a, in a corridor, in a thatched hut, lay a woman, uh, obviously very ill. Jilly said she sat down beside, kneeled before her, 
and placed an arm on her body and the woman started crying and when the sobs had subsided jilly says she said nobody has touched me in two weeks and it was that touch which appealed to her more than anything else maybe more than any medicine that kashel or i could find maybe that would help me at that time and i am hoping that that terrible loneliness would be solved at least to some extent by some physical company but that physical loneliness is only one type of loneliness <clears throat> in the middle of a crowd in the middle of all my family and friends there are some things that may make me feel so lonely <clears throat> jacqueline johnson owns said about cancer cancer is isolating and the isolation can hurt far more than the pain suddenly you the person with cancer is on one side of a wall and everybody else is on the other side the normal side that loneliness comes it's not only really cancer specific that loneliness comes when the person suffering is not understood by others i am likely to feel that loneliness when i don't have an appetite and my loving family wants me to eat and eat and eat and keep lovingly forcing food on me and i would be crying within myself these people who have lived with me for so many years don't understand what i am going through and every bit of their well intentioned love is something that will keep adding to my suffering they will want me to do this and somebody may say don't give up keep on fighting you cannot give up don't be a coward be brave fight 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 and i wish this person would if only he would go away i could have some peace and the company that is given by people who do not under try to understand what i am going through who do not listen to me can give me a fearful kind of loneliness and that's a terrible kind of loneliness and perhaps there is yet another kind of loneliness that could be have a spiritual element to it that's the loneliness i may feel when i am living alone in my house and maybe my son cannot bear the thought of my me being alone and me lovingly keep on putting pressure on me to accompany him to his home in san jose or my other son to his sixth floor apartment in bengaluru their love and my desire to please them may tempt me to go with them and then i am likely to feel the loneliness of total disconnectedness it is silly both their homes are so much more comfortable than mine but i still am connected to that house and that surrounding to that tree that i can see through the window and i somehow feel very attached to the songs of birds that always wake me up at around 5:30 in the morning and that is what i might miss and i fear that i will feel in the midst of my loved ones a total stranger so before you try with all your love to take your loved elder one away from uh, there where they are connected think again i did this to my dad he was 93 and one day 
as he was pottering around the his garden and always lamenting about how badly kept everything was he fell down nobody knew he was living alone all four of our children were living elsewhere there was a caretaker in the family and he looked when looking for him maybe after half an hour maybe after one hour and found him lying under the tamarind tree we heard about it and we all rushed there so he was unfazed so what's wrong i just lay there under the tamarind tree and he said that was fine what are you all worrying about eventually he came and looked for me brought me back but we would have none of it <coughs> he chose to spend a night with the eldest we took him to that place that night he found himself inside a prison behind bars it was not the prison that really worried him more it was the thought that his loving son could imprison him later he came out of that delirium the next day but the image of the prison remain with him as a real memory he forgave his eldest son for imprisoning him but he still felt sad that he could do it to him he was not comfortable there <clears throat> i took him to my home still farther away he stood the journey well was seemed reasonably happy came into my house and uh, lay in a bedroom and then came out and said where is he i asked who my brother he said he was here just now i was talking to him he was imagining his brother who was dead for the last 32 years and he missed him and then when somebody pointed out but didn't he die 32 years back he was totally confused after some time he said give me dinner he had dinner and then said tomorrow morning by about 7 take me back home and then he talked to his brother for a minute went to bed in about half an hour he was dead i don't know what killed him whether it was his age he had no specific illness or whether it was the loss of his world i don't know what i do know that in the last two days of his life we gave him suffering with all good intentions this kind of total disconnectedness is one element of the suffering that i foresee that may not be easily pursued by others there is another spiritual element to that suffering and that would be a total loss of purpose no meaning in life to give meaning to that life i don't know any shortcut but tusha you do it because it's no i don't think it's only the music through that music by spending that time you are con- you convey to your mother that you really cared for her i think that the feeling loved being able to give love that is certainly a great medicine for that kind of loneliness thank you for listening to me patiently i had promised usha that i would stick to time i did not keep my promise i overran it by almost a minute but i am glad i had this opportunity to share this with you i think you are all people very close to god i don't have to go to a temple to pray meeting people like you is enough Thank you very much for this opportunity to be with all of you. Namaste.
So, Dr. Rajagopal, this is a divine town, or at least I call it my slice of heaven. I've been here for a long time, so I know a lot of people here. Um, I wanted to ask one question before we open up to the audience. Um, I see Gary Wickland here, who works um, in a big way on Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Uh, and I know through him that when somebody has dementia, um, it is not just the patient, but also the caregivers that go through overwhelming kind of situations. Um, how can a community or your community of volunteers identify when a caregiver is overwhelmed? How can we kind of collectively gather up resources to do something about that as well? Thank you, Usha. Maybe you know the answer more than myself. The suffering of the caregiver is something that is not really acknowledged. The patient gets a lot of empathy. The caregiver is supposed to do it and we keep on burdening them with instructions and information. What they have is a disenfranchised suffering, as if they have no right to suffering. And at least in palliative care, we recognize that the patient's family needs care and support. And I hope someday we would have this army, army of volunteers and specialist volunteers who, who know more about Alzheimer's and more about it, somebody with treating somebody with Parkinson's and somebody with a motor neuron disease people who understand this and are willing to give that companionship and understanding. I, I do not have an answer to your question, but I am sure the question contains an answer that we must look for that answer and create that opportunity. Thank you. So if any of you have questions, could you please come to the mic and ask it of Dr. Rajagopal? Please feel free to come up. Ashwini, please. So first, I want I want to thank you for visiting. Um, super enlightening, and I think it's very personal for many people in this room. I lost my mom to cancer, and my father, unfortunately, is suffering from cancer. But he is the kind of guy you describe: very active, wants to control his life. Currently, is not able to do it. And so we, the loving daughters, are trying to help him and, you know, uh, asking him to come over and all that stuff, which exactly the way you mentioned, he's very comfortable where he is. So my question to you is, what can we do to help him yet allow him to be where he is? Because he fully intends to get better, whether he will or not is up to his body. But... Um, what can we do long distance? If I was in Pune itself, I would be with him, but I'm not. So what can we do? So a, a nurse chaplain from Hawaii who worked in Christian Medical College Bellur for many, many years, who is now back in Hawaii, his name is Trevor Land, has one prescription for this. Meet the person where he is. But we also will remember that he may not stay there forever and now he is fighting it. I think he will need understanding as he fights it. But at some time he will get tired of fighting. I think he needs help to come to terms with that. And at that time he may even say, okay, how about it? Shall I come with you? I think it would be his choice, but you will not be able to be with him for the remaining remainder of his life. And I'm sure he understands that. But apart from what care you can convey through the telephone and an occasional visit, the other thing that, the only thing that I think you must do is to find out what, how about it, Papa? What exactly would you like? Shall I get 
shall we get another home nurse for you so that two can take turns and if you don't like her we will find somebody else or maybe by that time there would be enough volunteers somebody to come and come around and give companionship but meeting him where he is and remembering that he may move to another thought process and another i think is part of it i wish there was an easy answer to this and i particularly worry about your burden of being so far away and not being able to do what you would like to do and feeling guilty about it and you would feel guilty if you went across and uh, uh, neglected your family here and your work here so you would feel guilty anyway but reconciling oneself to that that we all have our lives to live and give as much of yourself even over the long distance like your music or just listening to them as much as they want to is all that i would recommend if i were in his position thank you um so you were talking about the distance caregivers i read in the new york times recently that there was a research study uh, being done at case western university as an nih funded study uh, at the college of nursing i believe on distance caregiving and i i read it and you know i could relate to it but the comments section was even more beautiful so if anybody wants to just check it out please do it, it was fantastic so there is also this dynamic of who is the physical caregiver versus the distance caregiver and in e- even my own family i get along with my siblings very well but we had this argument about which one is producing more quality caregiving is it because you're away or because you're nearby and it's not a simple answer at all um any other questions please hello no thank please you. come that's frank abud if for anybody who doesn't know him Uh, I'm just wondering about your thinking about giving hope to a person who's desolate and lonely and dying. What's your thinking about that? How do they react to our attempt to give them hope? Life becomes totally meaningless without hope hopelessness is a terrible thing to live with we need to give them hope but it has to be realistic hope giving false reassurance and trying to sustain unrealistic hope telling papa you are going to get better you are going to walk when the, you know that it's not likely to be possible actually makes the person more lonely they would tell from your face that you are lying and or they would consider you a fool there's no sense in listening to this girl anymore and if my hope is for something that cannot be achieved i need your help to come to terms with that and still keep something that is still attainable something that's to my liking something that i would really want to achieve usha do you have one full minute i had this man relatively uneducated man who came in agonizing pain begging to be killed with his pain gone he wanted to be cured and when we eventually gave him the truth that we didn't say no it cannot be cured we said though a cure is not possible what we think we can do is to make you comfortable enough to do some things that you have always wanted to do what do you want to do maybe uh, <laughs> people from civilized society would have wanted very 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 
difficult things to achieve but this humble man had just one wish i want to go back to my primary school where i studied he had had only primary education we persuaded the children to take him on that two hour drive they rented a car and took him he got out of the car walked around in his old classroom went to the stream beside the school where they used to wash their lunch boxes after lunch found that there was there was no water there and lamented over the fact wanted to climb the hill that he and his uh, classmates climbed during break found that he could not climb came back and said let us go home and on his way back he said i am at peace now i wish i could sit down with him and found out what connected him to that school there was something there and the hope thereafter is to find out what is most important to them and sometimes they don't know that's when i'll tell them tell me the story of your life and they will start talking about childhood and their faces will glow at some point of time when it's about things that was very important to them and from them we may help him to think about something that will give meaning to his life i'm not sure that it will always work but i would give it a jolly good try to find something meaningful for him so that he has hope of achieving that and that may be just being loved thank you are there any more questions i have one last one please <coughs> Um so I am a nursing assistant and I often work on the palliative care inpatient unit. Um and one of the things that really struck me about your clinic was how much time the physicians and the nurses are able to spend with the patients but unfortunately in our healthcare system um especially when you have a lot of patients it's hard to find the time to spend with the patients. Um so what are some things that you would suggest that we can do in a short amount of time that can make an impact on the patient's experience with palliative care. Isabella, it was a pleasure to have you with us for 3 weeks. Uh and thank you for the question. My first answer is when I am your patient, you don't necessarily have to give all the time. I think one of the problems is that doctors and nurses often feel that only they can give care. That's why we need to expand the service so that much of the communication, the listening, etc can happen from somebody else. I don't think we are giving them enough time either. It is still an attempt at dividing time equitably. the lonely suffering person in his home get seen once a week or once a fortnight but when we are there if we are spending one hour on the road we make sure that we give that half an hour and i think it's more about being present if it's only for 5 minutes being present i know the system may not permit that often you will have the forms to fill and documentation to complete and that will keep us busy but whatever time i have i try to be present and be available to them during that period of time and i make use of the service of volunteers and social workers and others i think we need to be we doctors and nurses we need to be willing to embrace the community and expand our team enough so that your expertise can be used where it is most necessary and sorry just one more aspect to this question sometimes during a busy day i know that this person looks as if the weight of the whole burden is on his head he needs attention but i simply do not have the time i 
may do one of two things i may tell him i know you are coming from far away but could you get some lunch and come back by about 3 if i can find the time or i may say look i wish i could talk to you you look as if you have a lot to discuss shall i get my colleague to talk to you and i'll find somebody to take over it's about not ignoring what i see in that person's face even when you are busy and if i cannot what i do what i would like to do finding the next best thing or the next best thing and trying still to address it thank you sibella um dr rajagopal will be here after the formal part of the um program ends so could we postpone questions um and you can greet him personally and ask him um i know padmini had a question we're running out of um time um can we give a round of applause for dr rajagopal um i'd now like to request judy levitt to come up to the podium and uh make an introduction of a very special um international writing program um writer who's amongst us today um and judy levitt serves on karta's board of directors and has become a very special friend of mine thank you usha Lucia and I had the opportunity, maybe um, two to three weeks ago, to attend a, a reception for this year's University of Iowa International Writing Program, um, visiting writers. Uh, each, I don't know if you're familiar with the program, but every fall for a couple of months, writers come from all over the world uh, to live and work in Iowa City and share with their fellow writers and maybe get some work done if they have time. Uh, usually 28 to 30 or 32 of them. It was a real pleasure to meet them. and one of the writers is here this evening so he's a fellow this fall in the international writing program or a resident uh Chandra Mohan Satyanathan Nathan um is a writer from India a poet he incorporates different media in his writing including performance and mixed genre poetry and his work explores discrimination in his country especially toward members like himself of the dalit class his advocacy efforts have drawn national attention and the 2016 outlook magazine listed him as dalit achiever of the year and he's going to give us a short reading this evening chandra mohan hello all uh, thank you so much thank you our city thank you usha so i feel very privileged to be you know in this at this venue reading to you so i i'm from kerala like india like the, exactly the same city as rajagopal sir is from so so probably so for those of you who are familiar with kerala sorry india so kerala is in southern part of india and is one of the uh, you know a very special state kerala has very high uh, human resource development indices like very high levels of education a uh, favorable sex ratio that is like there are more women than there are men so it's very, very rare in india like you know so kerala is supposed to be a very very um, yeah yeah very progressive and uh, has living standards comparable to america in some aspects so but there is uh, you know uh, all of all over india india has some kind of uh, a social hierarchy just like we have it here okay so my writing my poetry engages with that okay and uh, Uh, so i come from the bottom of the hierarchy so i'm we call dalits so this dalit is a term which you know which represents assertion it's it's like negritude you know black people assert their pride so it's is against the assert against discrimination so this poem is uh, situated or what is it it is backgrounded in uh, in the cultural atmosphere of kerala my home state where uh, rajagopal sir hails from so this poem uses certain terms or terminologies from the game of cricket I believe uh, cricket is like family to India, India people who are from South Asia. Cr- cricket is a game like I don't know. People say there is an interesting quote about cricket. The uh, quote is that cricket is an Indian sport accidentally discovered by the English. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is by a sociologist by name Ashish Nandi. So it's called cricket is an Indian sport accidentally discovered by the by the English Ashish Nandi. So the poem goes like this. 
it, the poem is titled a local train conversation okay it's a, it's a local train conversation so as a uh, so i have an epigram so which i've already told you is, is this cricket is an indian sport accidentally discovered by the english ashish nandi as a st- as a station moves i glance at the elderly man seated opposite me still like an inanimate cog in a wheel as the station moves i glance at the elderly man seated opposite me still like an inanimate cog in a wheel his religious mark between his eyebrows so indians have a religious mark here like maybe you know the famous mathematician ramanujan he has a religious mark here so his religious mark between his eyebrows like a one eyed searchlight patrolling <coughs> for moonlight indiscretions down the ages as a train furrows through a dimly lit tunnel his insidious queries insist with his swiss knife tongue are like a handshake prolonged to probe the pulse of my wrist his insidious queries are like a handshake prolonged to probe the inside of my Uh, uh, probe the pulse of my wrist he tries assessing me with an in swinger first what's your full name then he tries out an out swinger that seems a lot what's your father's name by this time he has lost his nerve and tries on a direct yorker what is your caste Yeah, so this poem is inspired from a video of Vasi Makram. Vasi Makram is a Pakistani baller. So the, uh, the, uh, the interviewer asks him, like, what's your secret? He just says, I just try to assess the batsman. I try an art singer. Then I try an in singer. Nothing works. I try a yorker. I get a wicket. So something like that, you know. There's this curiosity to know the cast of the other person. Especially in Kerala, where suppose a person's name is Raja Kopal that doesn't even give out his cast. So then immediately the other person is very curious. He'll try to ask you, like, where are you from? Okay, so who are your neighbors? Like, where were you born? Okay, tell me your full name. Okay, so so then the full name doesn't have you know, any any clue. Then most of the time, his father's name will have, you know, the ancestry hidden in there. So they'll ask you, what's your father's name? Nothing works out. He'll ask you, what's your caste? Say so that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Chandra Mohan, as you were talking, I was thinking about Chandra Shekhar and his googly balls, you know, a long time ago. Um, so finally, this dying well glocalizer cannot end without some added rejuvenating reference. I don't want to feel sad anymore. To how I first came to know about Dr. Amar Rajagopal of Trivandrum, Kerala. It was through our own Iowa-based visionary Raj Rajagopal. As a Karta ambassador, Professor Raj Rajagopal, now Emeritus Professor Raj Rajagopal, continues to be my most inspiring collaborative doer par excellence. I think he's in, room, in the room now. Can you make a cameo appearance for us, please? This is R. Rajagopal, based in Iowa City, who identified Dr. M. R. Rajagopal in 2006. That's when I first heard about Dr. Rajagopal of Trivandrum, Kerala. <clears throat> so with both of them being here, we have the double pleasure and I wanted um, Professor Rajagopal, who's now the founder of a new nonprofit called Manodharma, to say a brief few words. Um, thank you. I just uh, went back. You have to use that. I just went back to find out when I met you. So we had several email correspondence back and forth in 2007 and 2008. He wouldn't want to come to Delhi to meet me, even though I was willing to pay his airfare. <laughs> he wouldn't want to come and meet me in Chennai. He said, you come to Trivandrum. If you want to know what I do, you come, and I'll take you to the patients, and then you learn about me. So I flew to Trivandrum in 2008, August 11th, at Patom Junction and Sut Hospital. That's where we first met. Um, 
and then the rest is history. I've gone there eight, ten times, met with him. And uh, one of my favorite uh, faculty member here was Joan Elan. And I just want to share a small story about her memory. Uh, this gentleman and what he does um, in India is transformative. Once you get there, you can't get out of it. You have to be there forever. I luckily got out of it because I had other missions. So, but Joe, after a couple of years, she came down with breast cancer. And uh, she went through all kind of uh, therapy and then finally both the breasts were metastasized and then she was still recuperating. So she and I must have had about 30, 40 times at the Java House. That's my office, Java House. <laughs> So that's where I meet with all the people who have gone to India from Iowa. I first proselytized them there first with the coffee. But she was interested in tea, masala chai. After going to India, she got addicted to masala chai. So I told her, listen, uh, I hope you're in remission. It doesn't come back. You just got all the treatment done now. Why don't you give it a break for a year? and then go on when you feel good. And she, with her standard posture, <laughs> this, is, this is how she would stand in front of you. She told me this, it stayed with me forever. With breast or without breast, I am going to India every year from now till I die. You have no right to tell me when I can go to India or not go to India. I said, okay. <laughs> That's, that was my first interaction. So uh, then uh, Anne uh, and uh, Cashel and a lot of other people came on. And uh, every year after she comes back, she and I would get a couple of chai discussions. And she was so proud that uh, Dr. Raju Gopal nominated her to serve on the Presidential Commission to develop the curriculum for medical and nursing schools on palliative care and hospice care. She was the only American nominated. She promptly sent the letter to me and then I forwarded it to Sally Mason, who was the president. Then I told her, this is what international collaboration, traveling abroad, learning from each other, all of this does. And now I'm going to toot my horn for a second and then stop. Now my new mission is to take 1,000 professors from USA to India on these missions. So I just got back after a six-week tour of identifying many more Raja Gopals in different fields. And it get America into India in a big way. Like they are taking 100,000 people to China. There is no such movement. He should have his palliative, pallium India should be occupied for the whole year with international visitors wanting to learn from his genius. So we could create this kind of thing. And every time now I see somebody grieving, it gives me a whole different perspective. It's all because of him. He took me to two patients. I sat with them for two, three hours. Then you know what you learn by watching people die? You learn about living. You know, you learn about it in a deep way. You come back with a passion for living because they teach you something. I didn't know so many other consequences were there when, uh, like, think of Mother Teresa. Forget about all the religious connotation. Look at her. Uh, day after day, she says, holding the hands of those kind of people, caring, listening, asking questions. So he made me do that for unknown. You know, I'm not a trained uh, uh, palliative care person, but then I could sense it. So I was with the family where the gentleman was passing away and the son, daughter, wife wanted him to go to Abu Dhabi. You remember the situation? And uh, he didn't want it to move from there. He said, I was born here. I grew up here. I know the land. I know the home. And all these things. They were con convincing him that we have the care, we have the money, we have the hospital. He said no. And the dad and son were not seeing eye to eye. 
So these are the kind of things you get to see about how people get attached. I don't want to take too much time. Thank you very much, and I'm so glad to see you here. So this is a photo op. Who wants to be here with both Rajagopals? <laughs> Dr. Rajagopal, could you please come over? And Anne, could you come over? And Kashel and Stephanie, and let's see. Well, James Ray, are you still here? Professor James Ray? <laughs> Did he leave? He's going to take yeah. a picture from there. Yeah. Oh, come on. You, could, you should come. Judy, come. Okay. Akash, Marcus, Shirley, please come. Um, somebody take a picture, please. <laughs> and can you light this? Usually, women light the lamps, so I got LED lamps, which men can light today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to switch on. <laughs> you have to light this. Rush Gopal. You have to switch it off. No. So yeah, I think, you know, how many economists does it take? How many palliative care physicians does it take to light an LED bulb? Yeah? So, Iowa Raj and... Iowa Raj and... India Raj. Kerala Raj, yeah. But what I'd like all of you to do is maybe um, stand up now and we'll take a deep breath um, and hold a moment of silence in honor and memory of all those who have passed, um, including loved ones, um, including a lot of the families affected through the massive floods, not only in Kerala, but in the Carolinas, in um, the Philippines, in Hong Kong, in China, please take a moment of silence. And thank you so much to all of you for coming. Um, and Dr. Rajagopal, as well as Professor Rajagopal, um, please come and greet both of them and talk among each other. I don't know whether there's more food left, please partake. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>